to receive in Tunisia, Dr. Nafusi. Dr. Nafusi is a famous pathologist, and a great pathologist. Uh, Dr. Nafusi did her MBBS in Mosul, Iraq, then she moved to UK to clear her FRC path and PhD. She is now a consultant in the University Hospital of Edinburgh and also a senior lecturer in, in, in the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Dr. Nafusi wrote many papers on research and review, and especially in gynecological pathology, and also she published a book about the diagnostic of soft tissue tumors. I think all of us know this book, and she is now she. <laughs> The issues are expired and all are uh, filled. Uh, Dr. Nafusi will be with important help for us in the future because some of some of uh, Tunisian pathologists know that we are uh, starting to manage a new journal of pathology in Tunisia, Journal Tunisian de Pathology, and she will be inshallah a reviewer and she will she will uh, write uh, le, um, review in the first issue of this review of this journal so i invite dr uh, nafusi to uh, for the her first lectures and the uh, untitled difficulties in the pathological interpretation of gynecologists gynecological tumors good morning thank you very much indeed uh, tahar and thank you very much sumaya for inviting me to Tunisia, which I consider like my second home. Um, this, my first talk, might take more than an, an hour, but you could stop me if you are tired, uh, because I thought I will cover all the difficult areas in gynae pathology. These are all examples of cases which we see every day and we present at our gynae oncology meetings. So we'll go to the, that's the, the subject I'm going to cover today. The first lecture is this problems and the pathological diagnosis. The second session, will, I'm going to talk about spindle and mesenchymal tumors of the uterus. And in the afternoon, we were going to present cases. And I'm going to ask you and we make it interactive. Of the problems of which we, I put them in order. So what we find in the vulva difficulties. The vul in the vulva, VIN3, and when it becomes invasive. Quite often they don't know, is it invasive or is it still VIN3? So I will show you some example. The other one which is really difficult, the differentiated type of VIN3. This is very difficult to diagnose. And this is more aggressive than the HPV related, the classical, which is in the young age a group. This is the difficult one. Uh, in 2004, the reclassification, they don't use VIN1 now because they consider it reactive. So when we say VIN, it means high grade. Okay? So VIN means high grade. So there's the subtypes, there are two types. There's the usual or the classic which is HPV related, virally related, and the differentiated, they call it differentiated because it looks like almost normal differentiated skin, not basilloid and all full thickness abnormality. That's why they call it differentiated. This occurs in elderly women and usually quickly invade into squamous carcinoma. So it's very important to recognize the differentiated. The classic, the basilloid type, usually is warty, just like wart, and it's basilloid or mixed warty and basilloid, usually younger age group, and commonly associated with HPV, and with cigarette smoking, and sometimes with immune suppression. This is what it looks like. Do you see VIN here a lot? Yeah, so this is the virally related, uh, you can see there's a lot of cut, like tangential cutting, 
but that's very common. It looks like jigsaw puzzle. This doesn't mean invasion. This is very common. See this tangential cutting. It's and it's basiloid, full thickness, abnormality. And if you look at the epithelium, there are mitosis throughout and loss of polarity. So it is the whole full thickness of the epidermis is abnormal and always there is parakeratosis. There is no normal keratosis, there is parakeratosis. The differentiated type is not related to HPV. It's usually in older women and rapidly developing carcinoma happen in this age and usually associated with lichen sclerosis. This is, you can see how the difference looks like normal skin apart from the basal layer. It looks very light, you know, with loss, uh, the basal layer abnormal, but up there is normal apart from parakeratosis. Parakeratosis is very important. You see the basal layer, some atypia. The other thing which is important, the, the reti <coughs> ridges, you see very wide and you see very prominent reti ridges. Other, you see here again, that's the basal cell layer, a lot of acantholysis atypia of the basal cell layer and you see the prominent reti ridges and this look how normal looking and there's invasion from that basal layer there are invasive nests here although it looks really normal but it's already invasive here this is another example you see the parakeratosis and always there is this red coloration of the cytoplasm eosinophilia of the cytoplasm with the prominent reti ridges a lot of pathologists, even gynae pathologists in our department, they are not sure to call a differentiated vein. They are not happy unless they see the invasive next to it. So if you talk about like take 100 pathologists, probably only 20% will be confident to call differentiated vein on its own. It's easy when there is carcinoma. You say, oh, it's, this is the... But the brave pathologists do diagnose it when there is no carcinoma because the implications there will be carcinoma soon. So it's very important. So if you are not confident, you could say suspicious features, suspicious of differentiated vein, would you please send another biopsy if you are not sure. This is another example. Can you see how it looks normal? No loss of just the basal layer abnormal and you see the invasion from these basal cell layers. So this is the most difficult area, the differentiated VIN. How do they manage VIN? Usually uh, when occult carcinoma is not a concern, if, if, the, if the clinician's not thinking there's invasion, uh, and we tell them, yes, it is purely VIN, so VIN can be treated with surgical therapy or laser ablation or medical therapy if there's no invasion. After resolution, women <coughs> should be monitored at six and 12 months and annually thereafter. So they always monitor them in case that they come back with invasion. How do they prevent when they, they, there is now in, in Britain, they immunize for cervical cancer and that hopefully to suppress also the HPV related VIN. Uh, obviously they should stop smoking and a lot of women with VIN when they diagnose VIN they ask them to stop smoking because they don't want them to progress. And the differentiated VIN uh, treatment of any dermat dermatological process like especially lichen sclerosis. The second problem invasive carcinoma. Straightforward invasive carcinoma every one of you can diagnose easily. I want you to discuss with, with you early invasive carcinoma when it's very beginning to invade. Uh, squamous carcinoma from over 90% of vulval malignancy, other variants <coughs> very, very rare. And also there are two types, the HPV related, which is the basiloid warty, just like the VIN, and the non-HPV related, which is the very well differentiated keratinizing that developed from differentiated VIN. So they really reflect the VIN. If it is younger age group from classic VIN, they mostly basiloid and uh, warty. 
squamous carcinoma are divided into also frankly invasive, superficially invasive. The superficially invasive, what we mean, less than one millimeter. Once it is more than one millimeter, it means there is risk of lymph node metastasis, and they have to do radical valvectomy. So this is also a problem at the meeting. Sometimes they said, well, maybe just below one millimeter or just be above one millimeter. And especially if the woman is young, this means valvectomy, over one millimeter valvectomy and bilateral lymphadenectomy. So it's very important to measure it accurately. If you look at this is squamous carcinoma, the NACE is irregular, easily diagnosed. And the, you see this nest with desmoplastic stroma, irregular, angulated, that's no problem for anyone to diagnose. And also invasive carcinoma usually have abrupt keratinization and eosinophilia or single cells, a lot of inflammatory response. So that's, that's no problem, invasive carcinoma. I, again, another, you see the abrupt transformation of the keratinized squamous pearl. Oh, sorry. Uh, when we call superficially invasive or stage 1A carcinoma, <coughs> do you want me to hold this? Yes. Okay. Uh, this means there is no risk of lymph node metastasis, and these are treated only by wide local excision. And look at this. This is differentiated uh, VIN. As you can see, it's very differentiated on the other side. Deeper levels shows this invasion here, well differentiated. And the measurement should be from the first dermal papillae to the deepest point of invasion. And that is uh, here less than one millimeter. So this is a truly superficially invasive. <coughs> and this is uh, treated by wide local excision. Now, this is the most important here. You have to look carefully because here where you are going to tell, is it going to invade or not? These are the features which makes you suspect there is invasion. The first feature is, can you see that basiloid sort of VIN? But there is a lot of intricate uh, branching and intercommunication. You see the the, there's no laser pointer, but you see these, how they like connect the telethread, slide to connect the gritty ridges. You see them here like spider, they are trying to connect. This is the first thing you should think, oh, this is going to be invasive. Ask for more levels, take more sections, and believe me, you will see invasion. So this is the first feature which makes you suspect this case is going to be invasive. So this is, we call it, uh, interbranching or intercommunication between the rate ridges. The second point which makes you suspect invasion, this is a basiloid VIN, HPV related. When you start to see this keratina or redness, abrupt redness within the basiloid area, you know you are going to find some invasion somewhere. Again, you see that? That's the same case. Here is the bas uh, basiloid, then parakeratosis, but abrupt here, redness, and this is the invasive here, because you did some levels. So this is like the clever pathologist should be alert to features which make you think this is invasive. This is another case. You can see, you agree, there is a lot of intercommunication here trying to branch together. So you know this is already, you can see there is one nest of invasion, but take more levels and extra uh, blocks. You see the invasive here, very keratinized, abrupt, and with stromal invasion, with the desmoplastic stroma. These are the rare variants of the uh, squamous of carcinoma of the vulva which really we don't see at all. The only one which we see rarely is the verrucous carcinoma. We see some acantholytic, looks very acantholytic. The rest are very, very unusual. Spindle cell you can see as well. This is the verrucous carcinoma. It looks like a wart, but it has this bulbous, 
projection deep if if you have a small biopsy very difficult to diagnose a lot of people call it wart so ask the clinicians it is big is it deep because if it is superficial you say i can't exclude this is from and we have seen quite few pathologists missing verrucous carcinoma as vulval wart because on a biopsy only so you need really to have the complete excision of that lesion uh, luckily they are a good the prognosis they don't treat them with radiotherapy. This is another example of verrucous carcinoma. As you can see, usually postmenopausal women uh, and the uh, role of HPV is in its etiology, slowly growing, rarely metastasized to the lymph node, and usually very exophytic like a wart, uh, and can be treated uh, locally. Uh, wide local excision is the best treatment. So they don't do valvectomy and lymph node dissection. And they don't treat by radiotherapy because it might transform into anaplastic carcinoma. Um, FIGO staging now of the vulval cancer is, has changed in 2002. Now the status of the regional lymph nodes is the single most important prognostic factors. If lymph node negative, no matter how big the tumor is, has a good uh, prognosis. Uh, this is you are going to read because I'm going to leave you the notes so we don't go through this. So th this is in the vulva, the most important now you recognize the type of VIN. When you think there's invasion, that's the most important, and the type, the commonest type of squamous carcinoma. Uh, in the cervix, there are two problems. <coughs> One in the squamous lesions and the other in the glandular. Of the squamous, this is again CIN3, and when it becomes invasive. That's when you want to know. This is a, a normal sort of, or the usual type CIN3, which is involving the surface and is going into the gland. That's no problem, it's going to the edge of the margin. What about this? You see how different this one? This is still CIN3, but really expanding the glands and going into the glands with wood really becoming fatty and bulgy and when they expand like that they produce central necrosis here and sometimes they produce abrupt keratinization when you see this this is we described i described in 1993 and all people know they call it expense we call it expensile type symmetry and the clinicians they know if they have expensile symmetry if it is going to the margin, they have to go and back and remove more. If it is like the previous one, even if it goes to the margin, they just follow by cytology. Only if the woman is over 50, they take another loop. But younger than 50, they keep with cytology. But if we say it is expensile after, and when we see expensile, almost we do levels. And over 50% you get invasion in this type of uh, CIN3. Another example, you see how fatty type expensile going into the uh, glands and start to invade here. You can see that level and there's the very, this one hasn't been separated yet, but it's a very early bud of invasion. And we, on this one, we could say impending invasion, about to invade. <coughs> so you see a lot of, because, because cervical cancer, so common in the waist because young women are promiscuous and they have a lot of HPV. So we see this every day. And so we, 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 we should tell them this is impending. If it is in the margin, they have to go and remove more. Another example of this expensile, you see the central necrosis. You see how involving a lot of glands with expansion and we, if you do levels, you, do, you might find invasion. And you can see there the early invasion. The early invasion, always <coughs> you can see more eosinophilic. It looks much more differentiated than the basiloid top. Just like in the vulva, when they become invasive, they become more differentiated. My theory why they become like that, because when the cells invade, they need to move like amoeba. So they acquire a lot of intermediate filaments, which make them expand the cytoplasm, become the more eosinophilic, and then they invade. Once they invade, they gradually become adjusted
to what they were before. But as they invade, as you can see, all of them, they acquire abundant cytoplasm and they become more aeronophilic. So th th this is the, the, the case which uh, we reported. You see, we called it histological feature of CIN3 and their value in predicting invasive microinvasive squamous carcinoma. That's in 1994. The most important feature, script expansion, central dyskeratotic necrosis, and squamous maturation and within the, uh, the abnormal area. So microinvasive squamous carcinoma is different from the vulva here, less than three millimeter, not one millimeter like in the vulva, and less than seven millimeter in width. So we have to measure it. Because of the cervical screening program in Britain, we do get a lot of microinvasive carcinoma, less than 0.1 millimeter. The commonest <coughs> things now is the microinvasive because they are picking them very early by abnormal smear. As you can see here, the measurement, the depth is less than one uh, three millimeter maximum, and the width seven millimeter. You shouldn't have beyond seven millimeter it becomes stage one B. If there are multiple fossa, you ma you measure the whole from the area abnormal area, and to the deepest. One other uh, type of cancer again uh, I described in uh, two thousand. We called it CIN3-like squamous carcinoma because we, st we review a lot of cases from outside and quite often you get cases, they look like CIN3 and they've been called CIN3, but the clinicians tell us, oh, she has big cancer and the biopsy you are telling us CIN3 and we, when we studied these cases, actually they are, they look like CIN3, but they are invasive cancer and I'll show you an example how they are different. You see here, this is this is actually a big, big, this is a from the hysterectomy specimen, that area here. They look like, you see, expansive cinefri, you agree? <coughs> it has central necrosis, but these, like almost ribbon, more crowded and deeper into the tissue and come adjacent to thickened wall. When you see vessels like these, thickened wall vessels next to abnormal area, most of probably you are dealing with invasion, frank invasion. In the superficial part, you don't see these thickened vessels. It's in the deeper part. Mm -hmm. So what, one feature is the really crowdness on more aggressive looking expansive CIN3. And again, this one, some pathologists are too frightened to call something CIN3-like invasive carcinoma. They call them CIN3. And I could say 90% of what we review of these cases are being called CIN3. And the clinician's important, if the clinical summary says clinically malignant, and we normally discuss them at the meeting, and they said, and there's imaging and everything. We said the radiologists, the clinicians, the oncologists, and they show us, they said, well, it looks like cancer. Some of them already went to the lymph node, so you become more confident in your diagnosis. But for you, probably, if you haven't seen them, you could say, well, these are, and I see, I receive a lot of consultation because I wrote the paper. Oh, uh, is this that the paper? Because the patients and I said, yeah, they, they are classical. We have so many of these cases. This is another case. Look at this. Sorry, the slide is faded, but look at them. They look all like ribbons, like CIMC, but they are quite deep. And if you look carefully, <coughs> there is invasion, tiny area of invasion around all these complex uh, CIN3 like. You see them there, here. This is another example. You see how crowded and filling the whole thickness of the loop. The whole loop is involved by this complex, what look like CIN3. Again, you see how crowded. There is no st stroma in between, becoming very crowded. You see them there. But then when you look carefully, there is some area of invasion next to it. Another example. You see the whole biopsy involved by similar process and there's lymphovascular space invasion here. Another example, we see them all the time. <coughs> I will show you this one, 44 year old woman. She had loop, which we call the CIN3 like invasive carcinoma. So she went for vertan <coughs> hysterectomy. And this is the vertan. You see how deep in the vertan 
the CIN3 like still it keeps that pattern of which CIN3 like very deep right to the almost to the parametrium and there is lymphovascular space invasion and lymph node metastasis even in the lymph node it looks like CIN3 with central necrosis has anybody seen one of these CIN3 like or maybe you have missed it as CIN3 <laughs> Would you recognize it next time if you see it? Yes. Yeah? You see the, this is in the lymph node. Okay. One other problem in the cervix, which is very common, sometimes they take a biopsy, and what you see, free floaters, like floaters of what look like CIN3. And from experience, a lot of these turn out to be squamous carcinoma of the CIN3 type. But you get just the superficial part of it. And again, a lot. I will show you some example. This woman, she's 70. They tend to be an older woman. Uh, she has postmenopausal bleeding. Clinically, clinically, this is important. Clinically, she has cervical cancer. And biopsy was taken. This was the biopsy. A lot of blood clot with little strips like this. You see very well defined, broken pieces. And I have seen it umpteen times, and colleagues just call this fragments of CIN3. Okay? okay? Yeah. I wanted to convince them, because the clinical history is carcinoma, and when they go to their time, or they, they cannot take, we first, first stage, we start to ask for another biopsy. And the other biopsy shows the frankly invasive. So as we started to say, these floaters are very suspicious of invasive carcinoma. And actually, <coughs> if you look at them, they are a little bit, the polarity is too much disturbed for just CIN3, too much loss of polarity. So in addition to the clinical information, and then you see, you see them higher power? But some pathologists, even gynae pathologists, still they said, we cannot call them invasion because there's no stroma. We can't see the stroma, right? But because the clinician's telling you there is cancer, at least say, in a view of the clinical information, these might be coming from invasive carcinoma. Please advise a bigger biopsy, okay? And we always get a bigger biopsy so you can say that CIN3 cannot rule out invasion, possible, because we can't see stroma, acceptable. So this went further biopsy. They took from the cervix and this from the endometrium, because she came with postmenopausal bleeding, but the cervix looked cancerous. And the, look, at this is the cervical biopsy. It's a CIN3-like invasive mm -hmm. carcinoma. And you see the invasion here into the deep stroma. And this is the endometrial biopsy. Oh, uh, this from the same patient. It, w it has extended into the endometrium. You see the invasion, invasion? And believe me, we are seeing this a lot of the time. So I call this a floater, a floater of carcinoma, what we are seeing. So if you are not confident, <coughs> but you have to, if the clinician's telling you, the clinicians know what they are seeing, is cancer, postmenopausal, say, well, these are very suspicious, although we have no stroma. Please take another biopsy. And one other problem is this sequimotransitional papillary carcinoma. This is always also underdiagnosed because you get this biopsy. And I've seen it again. They call it papillary CIN3, OK? We, we don't have papillary CIN3. There is no entity called papillary CIN3. They said, well, because there is no stroma and they look all like CIN3. But the thing you say to them, there are blood vessels like transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. You agree? They have core of, that's the criteria, core of blood vessels, vascular stroma. And you can see these vessels, it's very characteristic, delicate, capillary within the core, and then the rest, yes, it looks like CIN3 or like transitional cell carcinoma. That's why they call it squamotransitional carcinoma. Another example, you see the vessels? Once you see vessels like that, 
This is not sinistry. There is no papillary. This is papillary squamous cell carcinoma. I have changed diagnosis for my colleagues several times because of that. And they said, we can't call this malignant. And in the meeting, I said, this is malignant. And we argue in the, in the front of the clinicians. And then they, the clinicians, they go and do the third time. And they find, I'll show you examples of this. This woman, she's 73. She came with postmenopausal. And again, you see clinically polypoid lesion on the cervix. She has a lesion, big <coughs> lesion. They took cervical and endometrial vibes first. And look at this. This is the 11 o'clock cervical. What it looks like, my colleague called this papillary CIN3, and he's a gynec pathologist. And I said to him, there is no papillary CIN3. I don't accept that. We don't call papillary. We argued at the meeting because we were both at the meeting, and I think this is papillary sequimus carcinoma. So let's see that they went for by a loop first. And the loop only showed these like expansile CIN3. Went for hysterectomy, third time hysterectomy, and in the third time hysterectomy, again, there is all papillary to the surface. There is CIN3 like, but there is no actual invasion. And this is characteristic of papillary. It's on the surface and it grows up. They don't, you don't see invasion, but what do you see? they implant into the vagina or even to the vulva and they grow and they go to lymph node metastasis. So this case, what happened? Eight months later, she came with a polypoid lesion in the vagina, which looks again identical to the previous one. And also in the introitus, which has again papillary squamous carcinoma. So it managed to seed through the vagina and into the introitus. She received local vaginal uh, radiotherapy after this eight months. Three years later, uh, vaginal recurrence again. They did vaginectomy with cystectomy, so no residual invasive disease was found. So <coughs> they are indolent, but they come back, and they meta I've seen four cases with lymph node metastasis. So this squamous trans transitional cell carcinoma, it has this propensity for local recurrence and late metastasis, usually uh, older age group, and they are P53 positive. This is the differential mistaken as squamous papilloma. Squamous papilloma usually very rare and in younger age group. Papillary CIN3, which doesn't exist, so if you talk about papillary CIN3, it is this entity, it is carcinoma or metastatic transitional cell carcinoma can metastasize either directly or through the urine and seed into the vagina, like this example. Believe me, the, the first one, which was 71, the woman, and this, we were presented in the <coughs> same gynae meeting, happened to come in the same week. One truly of the cervix, the other, this one, she had TCC removed before, and uh, in August of five, she had multiple vaginal recurrences, and so they removed the excision. And look at them, they look exactly the same. You see the core of the vascular core, and they look exactly the same, and these were from the vagina. So this is recurrence of transitional cell carcinoma into the vagina, metastatic from TCC. So now with the squamous and the cervix, we've got the expansile CIN3. And if you see it, do levels to see invasion. Then the cin feel like squamous carcinoma, which is very difficult on biopsy. Then the floater, remember? And then the squamous transitional. The other is easy to diagnose. Of the glandular lesion, the problem when it is CGIN or adenocarcinoma in situ, when they become invasive. Let's see some examples of C G Do you call it CGIN or you call it adenocarcinoma in situ or cell? What do you call these lesions? Adenocarcinoma, yeah. Okay, call it adenocarcinoma in situ. You can see them dark color at low power. And the cells, you can see uh, loss of polarity different sizes cells, and the mitosis always goes towards the lumen. 
they call them the floating mitosis. They just move towards the, the, the surface of the glands. You see again here, abrupt transformation between normal and abnormal, like in this other one, and they tend to be P16 positive. So P16 is beautifully distinguished between the normal and the abnormal area. Do you use P16? Fantastic stand for cervix because it's just like light. It picks up the abnormal area. You see these floating mitosis? They float into the cytoplasm. They don't divide in between the nuclei. They just go out. Uh, again, more floating mitosis, abnormal cells. Uh, apoptosis, another features of the adenocarcinoma in situ. Goblet cells differentiation. And some papillary enfoldings like this. And sometimes you can see some cribriform <coughs> pattern. So these are the criteria of uh, adenocarcinoma in situ or high-grade CGM. Immunostains P16 diffuse and strong staining. MIB1 highlights the proliferative nuclei. CEA just focal, not all the time it's focal. Uh, PAX2 we don't <coughs> use it, but there's loss of the nuclear <coughs> expression. You see again P16 here between the normal, the top one, abnormal area and the normal, and the MIB1, the proliferative markers, and the lower one. So now. That's the important thing. When you start to suspect adenocarcinoma is becoming invasive, you have to identify the features now. When you find them becoming confluent like that, very, very crowded, this is very superficial, and a lot of people will say this is adenocarcinoma in situ. What you would call it? To me, this is too crowded, confluent. You could say, well, this is too confluent, very suspicious. I would say very suspicious of early superficial adenocarcinoma. <coughs> you see the higher power here? Because there's no, just, just like endometrial carcinoma, when there's no stroma left in between, it becomes so confluent. So this is, but the only problem, this was superficial. If it was deep, you have no problem calling it adenocarcinoma. Only because it's superficial, you can't call it just adenocarcinoma inside. You see the cribriform pattern, very confluent, loss of the stroma in between. But then you want features more important. Look at this. You see how it becomes again eosinophilic, acquire more cytoplasm and become reddish color like squamous. So adenocarcinoma, when it invades, the cells also become squamoid. Because the cytoplasm acquire intermediate filament to invade and become more abundant and more eosinophilic. So when you see in, in adenocarcinoma, they start to change color, you know it's going to invade. And when they invade, they invade like eosinophilic buds. Sorry? No, 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 that's not metaplastic. That's just because they are invading. A lot of people think this is metaplastic. No, these are the adenocarcinoma. When they invade, they become eosinophilic. If you, you do general pathology, is that right? Yes. Go and see adenocarcinoma in the lung or in the colon. When they invade, they become more squamoid. They have this abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. Just this is the process of invasion of adenocarcinoma. You see another area here? You see here the adenocarcinoma, you see how it becomes more squamoid and just like amoeba and it's invasive. So when you find the color change, you know it's going to invade. This is another example here, more acquired, more cytoplasm and it's, it's invasive. The other features is when you see this thinning, thinning and attenuation as if someone pulling the glands like elastic band. In my book, I describe it as elastic band sign. When you got elastic band signs in adenocarcinoma in situ, this means it's invasive. That's the features of early invasion. So you start to, to put all together. So the squamoid change, the elastic band or thinning and attenuation of the glands, 
You see here, what do you see? Square point change and thinning and attenuation, both, with the stromal response. So it's got all the features which indicates early invasion. This one, you see the thinning and attenuation next to adenocarcinoma in situ, you know you are, and this is in the deep also stroma. Other features which makes you suspect invasion when the whole full loop, do you get loop excision of cervix a lot or? <coughs> yeah, I mean, in the department we get every single day at least 15 loop excision. Because it's a big department and there's so much cytology screening, abnormal smear, they take loop. So we, that's the loop, that's the whole full thickness loop. When the full thickness of the loop involved by this process, which looks like adenocarcinoma, we don't know what's much less <coughs> left. So this is by itself suspicious could be the invasive, because the whole thickness. And when you look carefully, you start to see the thinning and the attenuation you see here. You see there. You see this vessels, thickened vessels. So you know it's already there are features here indicative of early invasion. So these are the features of invasion uh, or indicative confluence and cripliform pattern, thinning and attenuation, the elastic band, the squamoid change, which you call the squamous metaplasia, it's just change, full thickness involvement of the loop, thickened wall vessels, and the stromal response. Microinvasive adenocarcinoma, how do you I, either like the adenocarcinoma in situ with these features, or sometimes you see small superficial, like the one where I show you the confluent. This is because the thickness is very small, so this is superficial microinvasive carcinoma. So I'll show you some more example, like this one, small superficial adenocarcinoma. So this is microinvasive, less than three millimeter, and less than seven millimeter, just like the squamous. And you, ca you can see here the invasive bits here, how they are squamoid, all of them. And this is any adenocarcinoma inside you. At the invasive front, this color, squamoid. Another example of uh, superficially invasive <coughs> adenocarcinoma or microinvasive. The types of invasion in endocervical <coughs> adenocarcinoma, you can get expansile invasion like you see in the mucinous tumor of the ovary, expansile invasion, where you, you find complex tubular glands or papillary with pushing the growth margin, and features of destructive stromal invasion may not be present. So this is expansile, like the one that's superficial. It was very expansile. And you got the destructive, just like the ovarian mucinous carcinoma now, expansile and destructive. The same with the mucinous, uh, with the carcinoma of the cervix, expansile and destructive. That's where you see clearly carcinoma, irregularly invasive, destructive, a lot of dysmoplastic dysma stroma, haphazard arrangement of the glands, deep location, and obviously proximity to large thickened walled vessels. Okay, smile. Do you know what's a smile? <laughs> Just make you smile. <laughs> smile means stratified mucine producing intraepithelial lesion. So it's not CIN3, not CGIN or adenocarcinoma in <coughs> It's something in between. And I'll show you, you see smile, whenever you see smile, you see some adenocarcinoma in you and some CIN3 because they produce both lesions. So it's give two directions. When you see them, always <coughs> we see the other two. So it comes with the other two. You see that what we mean by smile. It's not quite cine 3 because there's lumen. There is a space. But that's not enough because CIN3 can involve the glands and would look like this. But what you see, can you see these arrangements like zigzag? Can you see the nuclei, how they are trying to palisade? If it is cine 3, the whole thing, you don't see these try to form a glance within a, you agree now, imagine them, can you see them? Mm -hmm. Can you see this house trying to make a gland? Another one here, 
another one, you see the palace <coughs> area? So if <coughs> when you look at it carefully, you now you can see these trying to form palisade or zigzag and there's a mucin. So that's a mucin producing intraepithelial lesion. It's lesion within the epithelium, but it's producing mucin. But features to make you remember it is this palisading arrangement or zigzag like arrangement. We see I'll show you more of it. You see this one here? A lot of mucin <coughs> produced within the cells with some lumen and some arrangement of cells in a palisade. And this is another one. But there are the palisade can be very prominent or can be very subtle like this one. This is another one, mucin producing intraepithelial uh, neoplasia. You see here how much the palisade and the mucin? <coughs> Would you recognize it now? Can smile. Smile? <laughs> More? You see the palisading arrangement and the mucin within it? Another area? Is that more clear now? Can you see the palisade here? Can you see the arrangement? You see these? The, the nuclei are arranged in, in a funny way. By the way, this is not, not described anywhere. These are my features. <laughs> just for you to know. <laughs> so this is my, the why is it significant? Because if you see them, you look for a glandular abnormality. Most of the time we see the CI in the 3D, very easy. But, and then once you see smile, oh, he said there must be glandular <coughs> somewhere, look for them. And that's where we lead us to mixed lesion, because you get a glandular and squamous. It could be like this, two distinct types. You see squamous on one hand and adenocarcinoma on the other. That's a mixed lesion. Almost collision. Or, or like this. Like this is ab almost abnormal smile, like adenosquamous. Again here, adenocarcinoma and CIN3. You see this mixture, top part of it squam and the lower part adeno, carcinoma in situ. What do you think here? You tell me. Come on. Oh, uh, smile. You see how you recognize the smile? Adenocarcinoma in situ here. Smile here. You see the, the, the cells, how they arrange? I'm in the process of writing up the features of a smile. Because we do see them a lot. Adenosequamous carcinoma, believe me, it is like invasive smile. A classic, you just like a smile when it becomes invasive, it looks like adenocarcinoma, and look at them here. You see? This is very deeply invasive tumor, but don't you agree each one of them looks like a smile? This is adenosquamous carcinoma. <coughs> you see more <coughs> of them? This is all adenosquamous carcinoma. And the mucin stain, you see? A lot of mucin in it. So now with the, with the glandular, you know the adenocarcinoma inside you, when it's going to invade, the change in color squamoid, the thinning and attenuation, the thickened blood vessels, and the full thickness involvement. Then you've got the smile, and you know how to recognize <coughs> the smile now and the significance. Now. Less common variants of endocervical, which you could see, we might have seen. Uh, just going to, to talk about the villoglandular and the minimal <laughs> deviation. Serous carcinoma, just like the ovary, and the basiloid also can be very difficult, but these are very rare. The villoglandular affect younger women, and look at it like a tree. This is the trunk of a tree. And this is, this is the classic villoglandular carcinoma in a loop position. You see the epithelium? They look like uh, papillae, thin, delicate papillae, lined by abnormal, obviously, mitotically active, malignant-looking cells. You see them here with the floating mitosis. And this is went for hysterectomy. She had this lesion in the cervix. And that's the third time. You see the, again, papillary pattern, but this happened to have also CIN3 in this area. 
and more infections, invasive carcinoma. So this is the problem with the villoglandular. When they first describe it, they say this is very good prognosis. Just remove it by loop, because they are younger women. But with time, they discover quite often associated with other type of carcinoma, either invasive square or quite invasive adeno. So now, unless they prove it is a pure, pure villoglandular, that's good prognosis. Otherwise, you have to treat like other type of carcinoma. Uh, it is rare in young women, and they say that's the first description, excellent prognosis. This is only if pure. Uh, m so that's why we must examine carefully for the presence of other differentiation. Uh, management conservative, again, only if pure. You have to think about uh, deeper invasion. That's when our experience often associated with other components. And in elderly, you have to be careful to call villoglandular of the cervix because <coughs> villoglandular of endometria <coughs> sits on the cervix and presents as cervical mass. And I'll show you some examples. Um, this is in, in the case presentation in the afternoon. I will show you. The other type of rare is minimal deviation. Minimal <coughs> deviation carcinoma in the past, they used to call it adenoma malignant. Now they call it endocervical or pyloric type. And there is another type which is endometrial. It looks like just endometriosis because no stromal response whatsoever, but no, also no endometrial stroma around it. But looks very bland looking endometrial like a glance deep into the cervix. So this is the endometrioid type, which I will. This is the adenoma malignant or the pyloric type or the endocervical type. This is the whole loop, you can see, busy with these, normal looking, but even at this low power, we see some irregularity in the branching of the gland. And the fact that it involves all the loop and there's some thickened wall vessels, it makes you think this is not normal. But you can look for other features. If you look at them, how they look bland, <coughs> no stromal response. But often, you do see the nuclei are more plump than normal. And quite often, you do see some mitosis. And if you look carefully, you see thinning and attenuation and squamoid feature of invasion. You have to look for them. If you don't look for them, you won't see them. So we always say pathologists see what they look for. Because if you don't know what to look for, you don't see them. Again, look at this. This is a biopsy. And you see that, that the way they this branching and, and very irregular pattern. That's not normal cervical. But otherwise, they are producing a mucine. The nuclei are not very abnormal. Uh, in a biopsy, you could do something. To, you see them here, how the branching very abnormal. You see that then you can see thinning and attenuation. You see the thinning and attenuation? <coughs> There is some stromal response here. There are some mitosis. You see there, mitosis here. And the way they branch and intercommunicate in a very abnormal way. How many of you have seen minimal deviation like this? Yeah, yeah, very rare, very rare. So features suggestive of minimal deviation when you see complex glandular intercommunication at low power some abnormal cytological features, and some features of invasion when you look for them. The endocervical subtype, as I said, we call it adenoma malignum, and there is endometrioid type. This is the endometrioid type. You see, it looks like endometriosis, almost always with the, with, even with apical snarls, with, and, but they are very deep in the stroma. This woman, she was treated with radiotherapy, because we diagnose it as, as endometrial type, minimal uh, deviation. And you see how around vessels here? Two years later came with parametrial involvement. That's biopsy of the parametria. Just the same, very, very bland looking uh, glands. So they form 1% of endocervical adenocarcinoma, usually sporadic, but also associated with post syndrome. Uh, they are not related to HPV. 
and often missed on small biopsy. And you can see it's quite often missed on small biopsy. Basiloid tumor of the cervix. You have the adenoid basal cell carcinoma, which is the bland looking and almost been be like some people call it epithelioma because they don't behave like malignant. They really benign behaving, but they call them adenoid basal cell carcinoma. The basiloid squamous carcinoma, like anywhere like in the lung, aggressive tumor. Adenoid squamous uh, cell carcinoma can <coughs> be very basiloid. Large neuroendocrine can look basiloid and the adenoid cystic. These are very rare. I'll just show you some example of the, the top one, the adenoid basal carcinoma. You see this one, a loop excision in elderly women, and there are these little nests of basiloid looking without any stromal response. And you can see them here. They look like a mucine producing basiloid. <coughs> and the behavior, none of the reported cases has metastasized or killed the patient. So they are really, loop excision would be the treatment. Another example here with CIN3, and again, basiloid nest, like you see them here. Uh, so it's very low grade a tumor. Uh, they they're supposed to be CK, you know CK7? CK7 does, doesn't stain squamous carcinoma, squamous epithelium, is that right? But it stains CIN3 or CIN very nicely, distinctly like the CK. So I use it sometimes to, if it's not CIN or not. You do the CK7, it immediately highlights the CIN3. But in these tumors, CK7 is negative, but CK8 positive. And adenosquamous of the cervix, if you think this is, they are usually CK7 and CK8 <coughs> positive. We come to the uterus. And the, the problem in the uterus is, is it hyperplasia or is it a grade one carcinoma? And some variants of carcinoma. Let's see the term. Well, uh, the WGO classification is usually simple and complex hyperplasia with no cytological atypia or with cytological atypia. For example, this is complex hyperplasia with no cytological atypia. Very little stroma left, and you can see the cells and some that have mitotic figures, but no really cytological atypia as such. This one here, again, complex hyperplasia, a bit back to back with mitosis and some cytological atypia, some sequamous moriole. In a biopsy, what would you call this one? I tell you, what, some people will call it complex hyperplasia with atypia. Some people will say we cannot rule grade one carcinoma. Please take another biopsy or even hysterectomy because anyway they complex with atypia. They treat them exactly the same as carcinoma, and 45% they would be associated with carcinoma. So it's, there's no harm if you say cannot rule carcinoma, go for hysterectomy. Or if the woman uh, is obese <coughs> and she can't have surgery, they treat with progesterone for three months, and we ask for a repeat after the three months to see if it's progressed or regressed. So that's the possible answer for that. Could be complex atypical or cannot rule carcinoma. <coughs> so it was called atypical hyper, and the only hysterectomy of that case <coughs> turned out to be just atypical hyperplasia, that particular case. This is another example here. My experience when I see glands fused like this, really no stroma left whatsoever, I think it's a grade one carcinoma. So. It's, you can say this is very suspicious, or some people, confident enough, they say, great one carcinoma. We always review these cases if the, if the patient is at surgical risk. The, the, the clinicians <coughs> want, if we, if we say a grade one carcinoma, and the woman thin and wants hysterectomy, we don't discuss it. They go for <coughs> hysterectomy and discuss it after hysterectomy. But if she's obese or she has any surgical risk, they present her at the meeting to see how confident about a grade one. So if not, we say, they say, okay, is it okay to treat her with progesterone and see if she could lose weight and she had the surgery? So there's always these options. That's the importance of the meeting. So that one, again, possible diagnosis. Some people might call it complex atypical cannot rule carcinoma. Some people, I would call it a grade one endometrial carcinoma. And in, on hysterectomy, it turned out to be grade one uh, endometrial cancer. 
there is a lot of confusion now about endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia. Until now, we don't use this term terminology. One of my colleagues, who's also a senior gynecologist, <coughs> he wanted to introduce it now. And I refused. I said, no, let's talk. We have a seminar in November with all the oncologists. And then we tell them about it. We, we know ourselves, read more about it. And then we introduce it. So they agreed now we will introduce it after November talk about it. So w the reason they introduce it, because of that problem, is it carcinoma or is it not? So they said, let's call it endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia. And they should be treated like complex atypical hyperplasia for hysterectomy. Or if the patient have some r surgical risk, progesterone and repeat. The same, uh, just to cover themselves. Yeah. And they, these people, they think benign hyperplasia is a, a continuum goes into endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, then become malignant. And again, they said 45% of this turn out to be malignant, just like atypical complex hyperplasia. Uh, so these people who published this paper, they said it's a precursor of type 1 endometrial carcinoma. It has 45% fold risk of cancer and may regress or persist or progress. So basically, it is atypical complex hyperplasia. And, and it has to be less than, um, I think, 5 millimeter. Uh, what is it here, it says? Um, the criteria. One well, less than 1 millimeter. If, because sometimes you get focal <coughs> hyperplasia. If it is focal and complex, le less than 1 millimeter, at least 1 millimeter, they call it, again, EIN. There is a lot of controversy in America. They don't use it. In Britain, they don't use it. But there are few papers published, and uh, it's just I'm not happy about to use it now. Uh, <coughs> how it does differ from grade one? The people will say, okay, how do you distinguish this from on biopsy from a grade one carcinoma? And I'll, I'll show you the answer. First, it has different architectural pattern. The carcinoma always has different pattern and there's more cytological ATP. Look at the pattern. First of all, architectural pattern. For example, this is a clearly cribriform pattern, and that's carcinoma. There's no doubt. Even if you've got it in a small biopsy, it has a cribriform pattern. That's carcinoma. Second, when you get small, crowded glands, you see they are becoming not only cribriform, they are minor, small glands. Even in a biopsy, crowded, small glands, that's carcinoma. This macro glands, you see one big glands, and then within it, smaller papillae. That's carcinoma. Even if you get it in a biopsy, that's carcinoma. The other thing, this labyrinth, you see intercommunication. I say to my trainees, I said, take a pencil <coughs> and drive through these spaces. They intercommunicate with each other like a maze. Labyrinth, that's carcinoma. Anywhere you see this labyrinth is carcinoma. And uh, when you see exophytic papillae, you see these real papillae, again, <coughs> carcinoma. Sometimes you just biopsy with, with papillae, <coughs> it's carcinoma. And then the cytological abnormality. You see with carcinoma, quite often you can see prominent nuclei, more florid uh, nuclear changes again like this one here. So what, what are the in endometrial carcinoma variants? We know the endometrioid or type 1. These are the lo less aggressive. Endometrioid, microglandular, mucinous, and villoglandular. These are the low-grade carcinomas. In our experience, the mucinous carcinoma, this is just from experience, quite often we can we come back. Quite often we have grade one diagnosed few years ago. They come back with <coughs> lymph node metastasis or pulmonary. When we review them, they are mucinous. So now the clinicians, they know when they say, we say mucinous, they are a bit concerned that they might come back. But there's no literature suggesting that at all. This is all from personal experience. Um, 
Then we've got the more aggressive type of endometrial, which is the serous papillary. They say it's up to 10%, but believe me, in Edinburgh, probably 25% of our endometrial cancer are serous papillary carcinoma. Because the criteria to diagnose them now, even if you find tiny, less, the first time when they produced this entity, they said, we need 25% of the tumor serous. Then they said, no, no, because they found them they have 10%. Now they said, any percent of serous, it would behave like serous. Because this clone can spread via the tube to the omentum, to the peritoneum, and behave like <coughs> ovarian carcinoma. So they treat them by radio, chemo radiation. So it's important to know that serous papillary, any, any component, you call it serous papillary. Clear cell carcinoma, much less <coughs> common than the serous but it can occur with <coughs> And by the way, serous papillary carcinoma, the pure endometrial, very rare, is almost associated with endometrioid. Carcinosarcoma, also in Edinburgh, we see them quite a lot. Uh, undifferentiated, that's very rare. Undifferentiated when you see no differentiation whatsoever. These are very, very aggressive tumor. D-differentiated, I didn't know about this D-differentiated until recently it's been described. Apparently, I've seen it before. Once I read it, I said, oh, I've seen it a hundred times, but I've never called it de-differentiated. When you see poorly differentiated or solid area next to area of grade one or grade two, you must have seen it all the time. But now they said, oh, we decided to call it de-differentiated. So there is like de-differentiation in other tumor. So, but the good things, the bad things, it behaves like undifferentiated carcinoma. So the driving component is the undifferentiated. No matter if you see well, very well differentiated the gland, the undifferentiated part will drive the tumor into aggressive. So these are all <coughs> aggressive, and the neuroendocrine tumors also aggressive tumor. Microglandular adenocarcinoma. Anyone who have seen microglandular adenocarcinoma? Again, you find them especially in biopsy because the superficial part of endometrial cancer can look different from the deeper part. And quite often they look like microglandular hyperplasia of the cervix. Uh, so, and I have seen a lot of cases where mistaken as microglandular hyperplasia of the cervix. And it is a type of mucinous carcinoma because the deeper aspect, either endometrioid but with focal mucinous, differentiation. And you would see now, and I'm sure you've seen them before. This is an example. You see how it looks like? This is a microglandular adenocarcinoma. If, don't you think it looks like microglandular hyperplasia of the cervix? Yes. You see the eosinophilic, the little uh, mucin secretion. But then if you concentrate, first of all, it's postmenopausal woman. And they tell you they took a biopsy from the endometrium. That's two things. The other thing, when you think about it, see, look at the nuclei. There are a lot of irregularities and variation in the size. You see the largest and the smallest. There are, and always you see mitosis. You look for mitosis. <coughs> so we'll see more example. Look at this. There is mitosis here. Or you see that, no, this is the largest nucleus. You see that other one, how irregular and elongated. You see the variation in the nuclei. The mucine, the pattern, yes, looks like microglandular, but the cytology differs. So the nuclear shape is different. The presence of mitosis, being in postmenopausal, with postmenopausal bleeding, being, receiving endometrial biopsy. So you say, this is microglandular type, endometrial carcinoma. And let's see more. Another example, you see the mitosis, eosinophilia. So only architecturally look like microglandular, but cytologically is not. <coughs> Another example, and you see the deeper part is endometrioid carcinoma. Vimentin is positive because vimentin is useful for endometrial carcinoma, and microglandular are negative. I mean, microglandular hyperplasia of the cervix negative for vimentin, but the carcinoma positive. <clears throat> so these are the helpful features in diagnosing microglandular. Numerous neutrophils within the glandular lumens, degree of nuclear atypia mitosis, including uh, atypical ones, areas of classic endometrioid carcinoma, if you see, and strong expression of the mentin. 
uterine serous papillary carcinoma, as I said, rarely pure. That's a pure uterine serous carcinoma. It looks like uh, ovarian type with, with cells falling into the space. That's very characteristic of serous carcinoma. The cells fall into the lumen, always, and with tiny papillae or slit-like lymphovascular space invasion here. You see that quite often serous papillary associated with lymphovascular space invasion. They can go and seeds on the cervix <coughs> by seedling or back into the lumen of the fallopian tube and that's why they spread to the peritoneal cavity. Um, as you can see here again, serous papillary carcinoma. So usually develop on atrophic endometrium. It is type 2 carcinoma, they call it, not associated with estrogen, post more older individual, uh, and so it's type 2. Uh, criteria, as I said before, they said it should be more than 25, then the more than 10. Now, any amount of serous component is called uterine serous papillary carcinoma. Uh, by the time the patient present, 72% associated already has spread. So a very bad prognosis. Lymph node metastasis up to 50%. The difficulty here, when you call endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma, which is a serous papillary carcinoma involving few glands, and people call it intraepithelial carcinoma, not endometrial intraepithelial <coughs> neoplasia. A lot of people just mix it with intraepithelial neoplasia. That's why we don't use intraepithelial neoplasia. In endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma, it is bad news because it is a serous carcinoma. It's an early stage uterine carcinoma. And now you see papers start to appear, they are calling it minimal serous carcinoma because little amount of serous carcinoma. About 40, up to 45% of these cases already spread to the omentum, even though they are tiny area in a polyp or involving a few glands because the serous cells fall easily, lost their cohesion, and they go back to the omentum and spread. So that's why if you diagnose a biopsy of a polyp with two, only two glands of serous carcinoma within them, the patient has to be staged properly like ovarian cancer. They do omentectomy, lymph, everything, even with two, three glands because they might find spread. If after that we don't see any spread, then they said, okay, they don't need any further chemotherapy. But if there is any spread, they will treat chemotherapy like, like uh, ovarian cancer. <coughs> so it's very important entity, endometrial intraepithelial <coughs> carcinoma. I prefer to call it minimal serous carcinoma because they are carcinomas. Did you, do you use P53? Uh, yeah, 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 we'll show you. They are usually P53 positives. So uh, when you say minimal uterine includes endometrial intraepithelial serous carcinoma, which is what we said, and superficial invasive serous carcinoma. Both of them are now categorized as minimal invasive, uh, minimal uterine serous carcinoma. Histology, what you see, replacement of endometrial surface or glands by serous carcinoma, or they are present within a polyp, or in its own, its own in atro atrophic endometrium, or rarely reported in adenomyosis or in adenofibroma, because they are changing into serous carcinoma. And to show you some examples, you see this is atrophic endometrium, <coughs> completely atrophic, and you see this glass, serous papillary. But this from a case which had classic serous papillary. And often cases with serous papillary, some sections shows this. Because they implant and they, I call them cancerization of the glands. These are really cancerization. But when they are on their own, they must have arise on their own as in the beginning of carcinoma. You see this other one here? involving these glands, classic serous high-grade nuclear morphology, P53 will be positive and affecting uh, just a few glands. This is involving a polyp. This came with just endometrial polyp, and you see that's part of the polyp, small 
serous carcinoma. So this is minimal serous carcinoma. This is another polyp here, and only in that area shows these glands, very high nuclear morphology as beginning of, again, minimal serous carcinoma. So they have both P53 expression as the classic uterine serous papillary carcinoma and can be multifocal and frequently coexist with uterine serous carcinoma. Minimal uterine serous carcinoma without coincidence uterine serous carcinoma can be associated with invasive extra uterine serous carcinoma. <coughs> so even though there is nothing no <coughs> large tumor, they can go outside even when confined to a polyp, can be associated with poor prognosis. That's why they should not be called intraepithelial carcinoma, in my view. We should call them minimal uterine carcinomas. You see, intraepithelial carcinoma in an endometrially curating specimen should prompt a thorough search for an invasive uterine and extrauterine. Uh, Conversely, an endometrial origin should be excluded in patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis. So if you patients with carcinoma and the peritoneum, you should exclude in early or minimal serous carcinoma. Uh, prognosis, as I said, if they confine to endometrium, has very good prognosis. That's after staging. They have to stage them. You can't say confined unless you have staged them. So now we stage all these cases may metastasize because outside the uterus. Recurrence and death of the disease can occur despite aggressive chemotherapy. This we are talking about this small, minimal. Complete surgical staging is recommended to determine appropriate patient's management and prognosis. More than 50% of them present with extrauterine tumors of identical morphology. You see how often? Uh, a transtubal metastatic process is responsible for the extrauterine involvement by minimal endometrial. So it's by cancerization, they flow back into the omentum. In general, uh, based on review of recent studies, you see, f like physicians at the MD Anderson rarely choose observation alone for women with early stage. And in state favor, not <coughs> one, but combination of adjuvant therapy. This is even when they are stage one, they said, even after staging, if they are negative, they still treat with chemotherapy at the MD Anderson because they said these are carcinoma and they probably, if we don't see the cells, there might be some cells already in the peritoneum. <coughs> so current evidence indicates that serous endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma or minimal carcinoma uh, behave uh, as a form of minimal uterine serous carcinoma with behavior that is a stage dependent, thereby necessitating complete surgical staging despite limited disease in the uterus. So I think the message now is clear. These tiny foci should be treated as frankly carcinoma mm -hmm. and staged appropriately. Undifferentiated endometrial carcinoma, these are recently described. They are lacks any evidence of differentiation. No glands whatsoever, no squamous differentiation, nothing. Uh, they have very poor prognosis and they usually high stage. Uh, may be linked to quite often, I because they are new, I have seen them so many often and we often call them serous carcinoma, solid serous carcinoma because we know serous carcinoma is more common. But they are, you can call them undifferentiated now tumor, and they can be associated with Lynch syndrome, which is the colorectal carcinoma syndrome. So you have to do the DNA uh, mismatch repair. Uh, often misdiagnosed as grade three endometrioid because of the solid part, or carcinosarcoma, or serous carcinoma, or neuroendocrine carcinoma. To diagnose a neuroendocrine, you need more than 20% <coughs> of the cells positive for the neuroendocrine markers. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these undifferentiated carcinoma, they do have a neuroendocrine, but less than 20%. And also can be dis disting uh, mistaken for high-grade sarcoma. So it's, this is one of the undifferentiated tumor, the differential diagnosis of undifferentiated tumor in the uterus. 
You see, this is the undifferentiated carcinoma. Very loosely cohesive, obvious uh, uh, rhabdoid, no differentiation whatsoever. When you see it in a biopsy, immediately you say, either undifferentiated carcinoma or undifferentiated leiomyosarcoma, very poorly epithelioid can look like this, or MMT, malignant mixed mesodermal tumor or carcinosarcoma, or undifferentiated sarcoma, endometrial stromal sarcoma, the undifferentiated type, because there's no differentiation whatsoever. And then immuno is, would be helpful here. You see the cells loosely cohesive, very mitotically <coughs> active, rhabdoid morphology, <coughs> necrosis, and lots of lymphovascular space invasion in this one. Very few, you see entrapped <coughs> glands here. Immuno stands for undifferentiated carcinoma, shows focal epithelial markers, so they can be negative in a biopsy for epithelial markers, which makes it very difficult for you to say, oh, definitely carcinoma. Can show focal neuroendocrine differentiation, dementin positive, but a lot of undifferentiated tumor are dementin positive, P16 and up to 50%, focal S100, CD shows that, lack sarcoma markers. So on biopsy, maybe you can't get the answer. You can say undifferentiated tumor, unless you're strong epithelial markers, you can say undifferentiated carcinoma. <coughs> anyway, they need to go for hysterectomy and staging. This is a 70-year-old woman who is a smoker. She has PV spotting, uh, and they found visible a tumor at the introitus, and also <coughs> they thought this is coming from cervix or in the endometrium. So a big tumor coming down to the introitus. And this is the biopsy. What do you think? Very undifferentiated, necrotic tumor, spindly a little bit but there's no glance, nothing. So again, this is the, your approach on biopsy. Undifferentiated tumor. Could be undifferentiated carcinoma, could be an sarcoma, leiomyosarcoma, or MNT. So these are the possible differentiated, or neuroendocrine carcinoma. This is the higher power, and this is a high grade undifferentiated tumor, and that's your differential diagnosis here. Even PINET, primitive neuroendocrine, can, can occur in the uterus, and we've seen it. Melanoma if it's from the cervix. So you do all, this is CAM5-2, strongly positive. EMA positive. CK7 negative. ER negative. Yeah, they are usually ER negative, these undifferentiated tumor. CD99 positive. BCL2 positive. Desmin negative, so it's not leiomyosarcoma. Although epithelioid <coughs> or high-grade leiomyosarcoma <coughs> can be negative for desmin but positive for other markers like smooth muscle actin, calponin, caldesmin, myogenin negative, smooth muscle actin negative, CD56 negative. So this is, we called it undifferentiated carcinoma because it has the epithelial markers and negative for the others. D-differentiated endometrial carcinoma, <coughs> as I said, you see undifferentiated component associated with low-grade endometrioid carcinoma. However, they are highly aggressive tumor, even when the undifferentiated component represent only 20% of the entire neoplasm. <coughs> you see there, here, one part is undifferentiated, the other part uh, low-grade endometrial carcinoma. The differentiated component expressed strongly and diffusely positive staining for cytokeratine, CK7, 18, EMA, ER, and vimentin. And the, the undifferentiated uh, component, usually negative for EMA, ER, weekly for vimentin, CK, cytokeratin CK7 and 18 can be focally positive, but it's not completely positive. The other problem is, uh, is it endometrial or is it, are you tired now? Is it endometrial or is it endocervical? Endometrial carcinoma involving the cervix. Either we see them as floater. Quite often in hysterectomy, you see endometrial cancer sitting in the lumen. So that doesn't change the stage. And then eventually they attach. And that's how they metastasize. And then they invade. So if they attach to the lumen, to the cervix, in the past we call them stage 2A. Now that this has changed. Does, if they attach, they, that hasn't changed the stage, stage 1. Only when they invade, they become stage two. So there is no stage two A and two B like before. Or we see them attach, as I said, to the surface or invade the mucosa. <coughs> if 
you look at this here, this is very nicely like a little mushroom sitting on the cervix from endometrial carcinoma. But this is before we call them stage 2A. And they treat with cesium radiotherapy. Now the staging is stage 1, this one. But still they treat with cesium because they know it's, they are there. They have to kill them. You see the higher power here. This is another one it's, which is <coughs> invading, invading the stroma. So this is a truly stage 2 uh, endometrioid carcinoma present in cervical tumor. We see in the cervix there. And the vimentin is strongly positive. Did you see CEA stains squamous epithelium? Do you know that? CEA, you see this is the squamous epithelium here of the cervix. And <coughs> CEA always stains the keratinized top layer. So in endometrial carcinoma, if you do CEA and you see small staining, they are squamous, squamous module. They, they stain the squamous epithelium. <coughs> I'll show you some examples. This 65-year-old woman, she had postmenopausal bleeding, and she had a friable lesion in the cervix. They took a cervical biopsy. This was the biopsy. What do you think? It looks like villoglandular adenocarcinoma of the cervix, and that's how it came to us, a referral, villoglandular carcinoma of the cervix. When we looked at it, we thought, yeah, it does look like villoglandular carcinoma. And the patient, preferred to have hysterectomy. She w went for hysterectomy. At first, they, sorry, she went for a loop because we saw it looks like villoglandular. That's ages ago. The, the, the loop was negative. So the woman kept bleeding. They decided to do hysterectomy. And this is the hysterectomy. You see the villoglandular carcinoma of the uterus, but managed to present as cervical mass. So we wrote this as a paper. We called the cervical implant from villoglandular endometrial adenocarcinoma masquerading or hiding as cervical villoglandular carcinoma. So after that, truly, we had this woman, she's postmenopausal, again she came with a growth in the cervix and they are querying into cervical or endometrial and was diagnosed as villoglandular carcinoma of the cervix but due to age, because of the age, we thought maybe this is like that other one, must be endometrial. So she went for total abdomen. That's the tumor here. You see how it looks villoglandular. Went for hysterectomy. There was nothing in the hysterectomy. And that's the cervix. So even though this is postmenopausal, which is very rare to have villoglandular, it is villoglandular of the cervix primary. But in general, you should rule endo endometrial when you have uh, villoglandular. Features favoring primary endometrial on, if you see squamous differentiation, like morules or squamous, folk stromal foamy histiocytes, or components of second tumor like cellulose or carcinosarcoma or clear cell carcinoma. Features favoring primary cervical, if you see intracytoplasmic mucin or goblet cells, apoptosis, floating mitosis, or IAS in adjacent endocervical glands. These are just uh, figure staging, you could, would read it. We come to the ovary. Yes, yes. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, carry on. Um, in the ovary, the most, we, you rem I don't know, most of you were here in, the, in December, and I talked about borderline tumors, you remember? if you were there. So I'm not going to talk about that because comprehensive, I gave comprehensive lecture then. Uh, of the ovary, the most common is serous carcinoma. Endometrioid, much rarer, clear cell rare. Mucinous also common because especially metastasis. There is now the undifferentiated and carcinosarcoma, just like the one in the uterus. And TCC, I never diagnosed TCC. I don't know, I must miss it. Call it something else or, or very rare. Uh, <coughs> some recent studies of ovarian carcinoma, they, now there are two types of carcinomas. Depends on the molecular and the clinical behavior. Type 1, they slowly growing the tumor, low stage at presentation, and they are associated with precursor lesions. These are the low-grade serous carcinoma, endometrioid and clear cell carcinoma, and the mucinous carcinoma. 
if you think about clear cell carcinoma, they are aggressive tumor, but they put them in type one because early stage, they present as low stage. They are usually stage one. Clear cell carcinoma, in our experience, very rarely go to the amentum. Usually present in the ovary, not like the serous. Type two is the aggressive high grade stage present at presentation, <coughs> is the high grade serous, the undifferentiated, and the carcinosarcoma. Now everyone thinks high grade endometrioid is, is serous. So now we call high grade endometrioid is a serous carcinoma, and they behave like serous, and they are WT1 positive. Young women with high-grade serous carcinoma could have an underlying BRCA1 or BRCA2 germline mutation. So if you find high-grade serous in young women, do this mutation. While clear cell carcinoma may be a manifestation of underlying Lynch syndrome, high-grade car serous carcinoma, there's the high-grade now and the low-grade. The high-grade, the most common, 70%. The low-grade, usually associated with low borderline, and that's where I talked about it in December, and it's associated with KRAS mutation. This is the high-grade serous papillary carcinoma, like anywhere, it's very commonly you find the tiny papillary with cells falling into the lumen, and what I put here is these intracytoplasmic eosinophilic globules. Yes. You find them in all sorts of tumor, in mixed mesodermal tumor, very common, in Kaposi sarcoma, in high-grade sarcoma, but they are very useful in, in when you see them often associated with high-grade <coughs> morphology somehow. Again, high-grade serous carcinoma, you see very pleomorphic, uh, micropapillary, uh, bizarre-looking mitosis, Slit-like pattern, this is serous carcinoma with a slit-like pattern. Some with giant cells. They are characteristically WT1 positive and P53 positive. This is very characteristic of serous carcinoma. ER can be positive or negative. You can see focal clear cell changes in high-grade serous carcinoma. Low-grade carcinoma, the cells are very uniform. First of all, you don't see pleomorphism. Very, very uniform. Mitotic figure should be less than six mitosis per 10 high power field. So very important because they, are, they behave less aggressively and they don't respond to chemotherapy because the cell's not very active to respond to chemotherapy. Again, another low grade, you see very macropapillary, but the cells very uniform, less than six mitosis per 10 high power field. They can metastasize, they can very aggressive in their metastasis to the cervical lymph node. We've seen them, they go everywhere. Clinically, they look very aggressive, but they live longer and they don't respond to chemotherapy. This is within lymph node. Immunosense in serous carcinoma, both low and high grades are WT1 positive. But high grade is also P53 positive, while low grade is negative. So we always use the P53 as if we are suspecting. P16 is typically diffusely positive in high-grade serous carcinoma and could be focally or negative in low-grade. High-grade serous carcinoma most com commonly exhibit diffuse, intense uh, nuclear immunoreactivity for P53, but totally absent staining can be also, or nothing can be in, in high-grade. While in the low grade, you can see the wild, just low, you know, wild type P53, which is focally l positive, and that's we call the, consider it negative. Unless it's P53, unless it's strongly positive in the nuclei, that's positive. <coughs> if it's just focal or weak, that's po negative. <coughs> so the wild, so called, we call it wild type P53 staining, that's negative. Focal weak or heterogeneous pattern is not indicative of a TP53 abnormality. Samocarcinoma is a type of low grade serous carcinoma with samoma bodies, just exactly typical like low grade carcinoma. They have good prognosis. That's samocarcinoma. You see uniform nuclei, low mitotic figures, no giant cells, but a lot of mitosis, and the momentum here. <coughs> Endometrioid carcinoma, 
now usually grade one or grade two. When they are grade three, now they are serous carcinoma, they consider them. And you see that clearly in endometrioid carcinoma, grade one to two. Endometrioid carcinoma with sex code differentiation, that's a difficult one because if you look at this, there's a lot of things going on in the stroma here, and then there are these glands. You think this is sex code stromal tumor. The easiest things to do in this situation, do IBPAS, because mucin is produced in all carcinomas in the ovary, not only mucinous. In any carcinoma, you will find focal mucin. So do mucin, believe me, in this, always you find a mucin secretion, and you know it's not sex code then, it's carcinoma, before you wait for your amino. You see the high power here? Why it looks like sex code stroma? Because of the stroma. It's very, very prominent stroma, and that's why you start to think we are dealing with Tortoli Leydig or some sex code uh, stromal tumor. So do the mucin immediately, and you will find the answer. You see the mucin here? Quite a lot of mucin in all carcinomas. We, we published paper um, ages ago about mucin and ovarian cancer. Every carcinoma of the ovary, they have a mucin project. Uh, not mucinous only. Every carcinoma, even solid. If you want, do the mucin and you find some mucin. This is another example of the sex called stromal tumor. You see how at low power you think you are dealing with the granulosa cell tumor? Again, it's the trabecular pattern here and the stroma a little bit florid. This is another area. It looks almost like juvenile granulosa cell tumor. But then other areas start to show this. And this trabecular pattern. And you see the mucin here? So endometrioid carcinoma usually WT1 negative or very focally positive, P53, the wild type, which is negative, P16 negative or jelly ER, usually strongly positive, but remember the mucin secretion. Clear cell carcinoma, very easy to diagnose. There are these large nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and clear cytoplasm. You can have this papillae with high line stroma, very characteristic. And you can see these hyaline stromas, so almost like amyloid in the stroma, very characteristic of the papillary uh, thing. The most difficult one, which in experience and people have missed it, when you've got these spaces, I have seen biopsies of area like this, <laughs> just tiny, thin, almost like adenomatoid, with lined by almost bland looking. But you have to, if you find a, the, the clinician telling you there is cancer, and they take a biopsy, and you see like cystic spaces lined by little glands, look carefully for a clear cell. And I've seen quite often of gynae pathologists miss this as reactive mesothelial cells or bland looking endosalpingosis. Only when you start to look and you see the clear cell, and examine more sections, you will find a classic. And I've seen them presented at the meeting um, as no, no malignancy in this biopsy. This means they have to go back and take another biopsy. And then on review, we said, well, look at this. You go back to the pathologist, do the others, and they find the clear cell. So this is the area of difficulty in the clear cell when you get the cystic pattern, which is very common if you look for them in the clear cell carcinoma. You see that, that the, once you start to see the, some cells with prominent nuclei, you know it's, yeah. this is the clear cell carcinoma. Uh, they call it the triple negative tumor. So WT, P53, all negative in the clear cell carcinoma. Uh, clear cell areas with an ovarian carcinoma as either clear cell carcinoma or clear cell changes in serous carcinoma or endometrioid. You can get clear cell changes in all these three. Uh, this is endometrioid carcinoma with the clear cell changes on the other side here. Uh, then ovarian immunosinous carcinoma. Uh, if it is invasive, destructive invasive carcinoma, this is very easy to diagnose. But the problem with the mucinous carcinoma often associated with borderline 
and when the borderline become invasive especially when it's expensile as well so if you see expensile but back to back with labyrinth crowded this is carcinoma expensile pattern if you find a mucinous carcinoma associated with a mental metastasis 80 percent is more likely to be colonic rather than primary ovarian primary ovarian rarely metastasized to the mental so any mucinous carcinoma in the ovary associated with the extra ovarian it's not ovarian it's usually extra so you have to tell them the amino is not helpful because they will be similar ck20 positive and ck7 positive can be like colonic or appendix cea positive cdx2 so amino is not going to tell us only clinicians they have to go and search for primary elsewhere before considering this ovarian if there is extra ovarian i'm saying if it is just limited to one ovary or two ovary and no extra ovarian whatsoever and associated with clearly benign and borderline you are more confident yes this is a primary but once you have extra abdominal metastasis or extra ovarian more likely it is extra ovarian disease you see that this is a mucinous tumor with benign and then become borderline and you saw there's some micropapillary here or serumucinous uh, so I'm not going to go more details because I've discussed it and one hour I can't cover everything TCC I have never diagnosed one and they're supposed to be WT1 positive so they are a type of serous as well perhaps it's type of serous and we call them serous carcinoma mixed carcinomas we do see mixed differentiation uh, and they consider if you have at least 10 percent of one or the other and the commonest combination serous and endometrioid and we know now endometrioid the high grade is serous clear cell and endometrioid you could find that together post chemotherapy changes in, in usually we do get because they treat with a new adjuvant three course of chemotherapy and then debulking so you see the abundant clear or eosinophilic cytoplasm in the uh, treated uh, cells uh, the nuclear features often bizarre with multinucle multinucleated giant cells a lot of fibrosis necrosis hemosiderin deposition dystrophic calcification so all this you can see after chemotherapy this is some changes of chemotherapy you can see giant cells looking clear cell change the other problem primary or secondary and secondary to the ovary could be from cervix uh, i mean primary and this is a general in gynae cervical or uterine we discussed that uterine versus ovary sometimes you get tumor in the ovary and in the uterus and which one coming from what <coughs> the general rule if the ovary is small and the uterus is small both endometrioid these are synchronous tumor that's no problem and we see them but if the uterine tumor is big and invading the outer third it's the ovarian is secondary usually because if it is ovarian when it goes to the uterus it goes to the outer surface to the serosa it doesn't go to the endometrium and then invading an aggressive so if it is really aggressive going into the myometrium and then involving the ovary it is primary ovarian and then it's, it's uterine yeah yeah so that's the rule and the ovary also is, is it gi or coming from the uterus i said or breast these are all common problem this is metastatic colonic carcinoma as you can see it looks uh, like endometrioid but a lot of necrosis you see this dirty necrosis we call it very very dirty looking necrosis within the, once you see them even in, in curitage you think of colonic carcinoma we have diagnosed colon colonic carcinoma and endometrial biopsy as you can see this dirty necrosis and then cei positive ck20 positive ck7 negative so krukenberg tumor always mistaken as fibroma or fibrotic coma because it's solid and the background stroma very active fibrotic react to these infiltrative single cells they do something to the stroma to make it really active fibroblastic reactive so people who are not aware they call it fibroma so let's look at this one here at low power it looks like almost fibrothecoma but if you go higher power 
You see the little signet ring in the background, but the stroma mostly is the fibroblastic stroma. Again, some glands formation here. Synchronous ovarian and endometrial, as I said, both of them are very small. You see like this one here. The top one is the ovarian, a, a little bit papillary, endometrioid, and the uterine similar morphology. The role of immunohistochemistry, we know we use all this immunohistochemistry in gynae pathology, and you will have that. So the most common problem here is you have to think of the existence of the entity. You have to think about it. If you don't think about minimal deviation, if you don't think about it, you miss it. Clinical information of utmost important. If they tell you there is cervical cancer, believe them there is cancer. And then look for undifferentiated tumor, the immuno profile. And thank you very much.